All right, in this video, we're gonna cover how to do moderation and regression. So this is regression with interactions. And I'm gonna use SPSS and the process plugin from Andrew Hayes at Ohio State. You can find it on his website at processmacro.org. Um, or if you just Google process and Hayes together, you'll be able to find the link. It is a free plugin that will help you run mediation and moderation much more smoothly than uh, traditional methods. Okay, so first let's talk about power. So how do I know how many participants I'm gonna need when I'm running a moderation design? So the first thing you wanna do is make sure you change this to F test, right? So the test family is still an F even though it's regression. Under statistical test, one of the options is probably going to be linear multiple regression, fixed model, deviation from zero. Um, you could also do R squared increase because you would want to know if um, the adding the interaction makes it better than not having the interaction. But since uh, this adds them all at once and you don't do this in steps with the process plugin, this deviation from zero won't really hurt you. <clears throat> all right. So effect size F squared here can be 0.02 for small, 0.15 for medium, 0.35 for large, or you can click determine to actually calculate that from R. So what would you expect R squared to be for your interaction? I don't have any idea actually, so I'm gonna use 0.5, what it's already set for. Um, alpha usually is 0.05 and power is usually 0.80. And then the number of predictors. Now, this is normally the number of independent variables in your study, or K, but in this instance, remember that we are gonna use the two main effects, so in our example here, books and attendance, and their interactions. So it's actually three predictors for K and not just two. So hit calculate, and you'll see that the total sample size for this example is 77. Okay, so I would need 77 people to find power if I had a, a medium effect size for the um, for the 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 interaction. Okay. So actually, in our data set, we only have 40. But so we'll see if we're able to detect the different uh, the interaction if it's there. Obviously, it is. This is made up data to be able to give you an example. Okay. So that is how you would test for power. So how many people would I need? Um, and just remember that the number of predictors needs to include the interaction as well. Okay, so what next? Well, the hard part about using this plugin, it's not even hard really, is that uh, you have to check the assumptions sort of separately from the actual running it. Now if you're running just a you know, hierarchical regression, you can check them at the same time, but since this is a special plugin, we're gonna check uh, the assumptions and then stop and then do the actual analysis, right? So remember that we're doing moderation. Okay, so moderation requires special, um, special consideration because we're gonna include variable one, variable two, and its interaction. And when you do that, it tends to create multicollinearity because um, Anytime you have two columns that either add up or can multiply and create a total score, or in this case the interaction, that means that their columns are no longer unique. I could tell you what the last column is because I know what the first two columns are. So when you create the interaction, you are actually creating a multicollinearity problem. Um, so the solution to that is to center the variables. Centering the variables is very similar to z-scoring them, and that puts the, the mean of the variable at zero, which is mathematically useful. We'll see that in a little bit. And it creates a standard deviation of one, which is also mathematically useful. I'm pretty sure the process plugin just subtracts the mean from every score, which does not make the standard deviation one, but you can use that idea of a z-score to understand what's going on in the output. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and so centering helps solve the multicollinearity issue, and it will also help us understand the, the numbers that we're getting and be able to create our, um, our different slopes or simple slopes for each separate um, level. It's not really levels because we're not gonna split the data, but each separate kind of idea of our moderator variable. 
Um, so this plugin will also create the interaction for you. However, if you need to do it by hand, it is literally multiplying the two columns together. So let's first check for all of our assumptions and then work through how do I run this analysis. So let's go analyze, regression. Oh wait, first we're gonna do missing data and uh, accuracy. So just kidding, analyze, descriptives, and then frequencies. So I'm gonna move everything over. Now my attendance variable here um, really should be set, let's go to variable view, as scale they're all scale variables it's so it's the number of books that a student read in a semester so it runs zero to four uh, the number of times they attended class um, and then what grade they made it in the class so all scale variables so analyze descriptives and let's go frequencies so we move all three of them over under statistics i can get the mean standard deviation but really accuracy checks are about the min and the max I'm going to turn off frequency tables so I don't get these huge output and hit OK. So the first thing I get is like, does do the variables run in the range I expect? So if there are only four books, zero to four makes sense, so there are no negative numbers. Attendance is six to 20, also makes sense. So you want to make sure there's nothing um, that's illogical here. And grades, I don't have any outside of zero or 100, so that also makes sense. Um, I can also look at the means and standard deviations to make sure that they um, don't look too crazy. And I don't think they do for when I know the books run to uh, zero to four, having a score of two is not that unusual. Right. So I would say that the accuracy checks are fine and the missing data, if we look right here under missing, that's also fine. So now I'm gonna do analyze, regression, and then linear. Our dependent variable is grade, and our two independent variables are going to go here in independence. So it kind of looks like we're running a multiple linear regression, um, which would be simultaneous because we're doing everything at once. But really, we're just using this to make sure that we don't have any outliers, um, <clears throat> any um, uh, homogeneity, homoscedasticity problems. So under plots, do z pred and y, z residual and x, histogram and normal probability plot, and then hit continue. And then under save, we're going to do Mahalanobis, Cooks, and Leverage. So all three in this distances box. And then continue. If you were actually running this as a regression, I would tell you to check r square change part and partials, but we're going to use the process plugin, so we're not. All right, so let's hit OK. All right, so let's work on outliers first. So I'm going to go back to the data, and you'll see that you'll have three new columns, one for Mahalanobis, one for Cooks, and one for Leverage. Okay. Um, now, there are a couple different ways to check outliers, and so we're going to go over all three, and I'm going to suggest that you only eliminate people if they have two out of the three as your criterion. So I'm going to show you a way to code those simply. Now with only 40 participants, it probably wouldn't be too hard for me to code them by hand, but when you get into having several hundred participants or even thousands, it would be very tedious. Um, so we're going to do kind of a little bit of a longer set of clicks, but it will help you if you ever have just a huge data set. Um, the other thing is we'll talk about how, how these cutoff scores work. And so you'll notice I only have two variables, books and attendance. But when I run this analysis, I'm at books, attendance, and their interaction. But I'm only going to screen for books and attendance here because those are the two variables that they gave me. The interaction is something we're going to create, but it is a product of these other two scores. And so I'm just going to screen for the two variables even though I'm going to use all three in the analysis because that third one is just um, in the multiplication of the first two. So if they're an outlier on the first two, the multiplication obviously would be an outlier as well. <clears throat> okay, so first thing we got to do is figure out what are all the cutoff scores for these different variables. Let me open Word here. <clears throat> and get a document started. All right, so for Mahalanobis, Make that bigger so you can see it. There we go. <clears throat> um, 
the cutoff score is going to be where a chi-square value, um, where degrees of freedom is two because we have two variables, and we're going to use p less than 0 0.001. So first cutoff score is 13 something. Uh, let's pull up a chi-square table. There we go. Um, okay, cool, Adobe. There we go. So 2 all the way over here to 0.01 is 1382. The next one we're going to work with is, actually close this so I don't have too many things open. There we go. Uh, Cooks. Now the cutoff score for Cooks is 4 over n minus k minus 1. So what we've got is 4 divided by n, which is 40 people over here. So we've got 40 lines. Minus k, there's two predictors. Minus 1. And what does that equal? All right. Let's calculate that. Right. Whoops. Got excited. Clicked the wrong button. Come back, calculator. There we go. <laughs> okay, calculator can stay here. We'll move this one over to the right. So we've got... 40 minus 2 minus 1 is 37 on the bottom. So 4 divided by 37 is 0.108. I'm going to recommend you probably go with three decimals because these are always very small numbers. The next one is leverage. So the formula for leverage is 2k plus 2. Do all of that divided by n. So in this formula, I've got 2 times 2 plus 2 divided by 40. Okay. So I'm only using 2 because it's all I've put into my um, independence box when I ran this screening. So I got 2 times 2 plus 2. Okay, so 6 divided by 40 is 0.15. All right, so how do I translate this output uh, or, or cutoff scores into something I can use over here in SPSS. So let me do this. So let me show you how to do a uh, transform and recode into different variables in a way that makes it easy for you to check multiple variables, um, uh, like to screen all three of them sort of separately and then combine it into one total outlier score, if you will. So what we're going to do is go transform. Um, recode into different variables and the reason I suggest different variables is so that later when you're trying to remember what the heck you did you have two separate columns and you can check and make sure you did it right. <clears throat> all right all right so I'm gonna take Mahalanobis and move it over here into this recode now when you recode into different variables you have to stick something into this little question mark or it won't let you take get the okay so I'm gonna call this out Mahal or Altma. And so basically what that does is it says, oh, this is me checking for outliers, and then I'm checking Mahalanobis. Okay. Click change to get the little question mark to go away. And you'll see I still don't have the okay. So what do I gotta do? What you do is you click old and new values. Okay. And so I'm gonna use these range variables. Since Mahalanobis distance is always, good gracious, iTunes. Since Mahalanobis distance is always um, positive, what I'm going to do is kill iTunes over here. Come on, go away. All right. Um, <clears throat> let's change that to 1382. Um, and then over here in new value. Okay, so an old value, what I've done is typed in 1382. So I want... Uh, all the values that are 1382 and up over here to change into a 1. So this is everybody who has a Mahalanobis distance score that's too high um, <clears throat> to be changed into a 1 score. So that means, yes, I'm an outlier. <clears throat> so hit add. Then to all other values and change that over here in new, into new value as a zero <clears throat> and hit add. So that basically is saying everybody who's got a 1382 and up, make them a one. Everybody else, make them a zero. Okay. And then hit continue. Good gracious. 
Okay, I think it is quite done updating my phone now. <laughs> All right, once you get all of that done, hit OK. <clears throat> so what that's going to do is create you a new column. And let me go back to the data here. So you can remember you can hit the star button to go back to the data. Where everybody who, who had a score of 1382 and up is going to be marked as a 1, which in this case is nobody. So if you look at the scores for Mahalanobis, they're all way below that. So we don't have any Mahalanobis outliers. Okay, so what do I do next? We're going to do that exact same process twice more. Once for cooks and once for leverage. Alright, so let me go away. So for cooks, what we're going to do, there we go, is do transform, <clears throat> recode into different variables. Now I'm going to hit reset. And what that do will do is just clear everything out so that I don't get confused or use the wrong cutoff score. So I'm gonna move over cooks, give it a name, so out cook, change, old new values here. So value through highest. I'm gonna take my cutoff score, 0 0.108, translate that into a one, hit add. All other values become oops, a zero, and hit add. It's the exact same thing. Everybody at this cutoff and higher will get a 1, saying they're not liar. Everybody else will get a 0. Continue and OK. So now we should have at least one person marked. I feel like, yeah. So this one score here had a cook score of 12.69. That is over a cutoff score. So they got marked with a 1 here. Let's do that one more time. So transform, recode in different variables. Okay, I'm gonna hit reset to get everything go away. Center leverage value and move over. Is okay, so out leverage, hit change. Old and new values, value through highest. So I got 0.15 and they get a one. And then add and everybody else gets a zero add and continue and okay and so now I should have all zeros I don't think anybody there's one score that's close but nobody really crossed that line so let this score for leverage is pretty close all right so what does that get me to go through all those steps well it tells me how many outliers I have for just Mahalanobis just cooks and just leverage I remember that Cook's distance is a measure of, um, of uh, influence, so it's doing both leverage and discrepancy, whereas leverage is just a measure of how, many t how much is changing the slope. Um, and you don't want people who have a really big influence on the slope because that means their scores are very different than other people's. Um, but it also gives me, it like does them each separately. So you could decide like if you wanted to use only one of them as your criterion, you could go back and look. Uh, the last thing I'm going to do to sort of complete this process is let's say you have 500 participants and trying to figure out and sort the columns would be very confusing. So what you want to do is transform and now compute variable. Let's call this target variable uh, out tote for outliers total. And then I'm going to take my three new columns. So out ma plus out cooks plus out lev. So I'm going to add them all together. So this will give me an indication of how many times they were marked as an outlier. So let me go back here. And this is the variable I would tell you to sort. So sort cases, sort our total one. Let's go descending, highest people first, hit OK. And so I have one person who has one outlier score. Now this is where I tend to make a decision. If they have two or more, so if they're outliers on two or more of my indicators here, I will eliminate them usually, unless I have a small sample or reason to believe that they should be left in. Clearly this is a decision that you get to make. Um, but I usually look for two or more problems on these because they're measuring all slightly different things. So it gives me a good feel for what's the issue. And I always look at like, why do I think their scores are outliers? And it's generally because they tend to have like a high leverage value or um, a lot of influence 
or their scores are, let's say if we're doing age, we have your normal 18 to 22 year olds that we're testing, and then we have a couple of people who are a lot older. Um, that'll often trigger an outlier analysis as well. Okay, so we've checked outliers. I'm not gonna delete anybody. So I'm gonna go back to my output here and go through the other normal ones. So the next thing we wanna check, so we've done missing data, accuracy, and outliers, is multicollinearity. Multicollinearity is pretty important with regression because otherwise you're gonna lose power. And if your variables are too correlated, you might have them suppress each other where the overall model is significant, but neither variable is because they're both so correlated with each other and the DV, you can't tell what's going on. And so what you wanna to do to check that is analyze, correlate, and then bivariate. We're gonna move over just the IVs, so books and attendance. Remember, we don't have the interaction yet, but the interaction will create multicollinearity, which we're gonna solve by centering the variables, and process will do that for me, and then hit okay. So they are correlated, 0.44, it's not a bad correlation, so it's about 20 something percent of the variance, but it's not too high. Remember, too high for sure is 0.9, but I would warn you at a 0.7, you're talking about 50% overlap between the variables nearly, and that can be pretty problematic. So um, you can proceed when they're that correlated, but you just have to remember that they're, they're highly correlated with each other, so you might, uh, not, you might lose power in that sense. Okay. In a perfect world, predictors would be uncorrelated, but perfectly correlated with a DV. Um, that pretty much never happens, so you gotta check and make sure they're not too correlated. Okay. So that's multicollinearity. The next gamut of the things to check are assumptions. So let's look at the first one here, normality. So is there a multivariate normality between the IVs predicting the DV? So um, this time it's gonna say grade instead of random because we're not doing this as a random um, check anymore. And it is, you know, it's pretty good. It's centered over zero, it runs from two to two. So no normality is good. I'm gonna check linearity. This is probably one of the best charts we've seen all year. Uh, where most of the dots are pretty close to the line. Got a little bump out here, but it's not bad hardly at all, especially for only 40 people. Okay, so I would say linearity is good. And last but not least is our um, residual scatter plot. And so you want everything to be centered around zero. So I'm gonna look this way. And it runs two to two, which is great. I'm gonna look at zero here, and it runs pretty much two to two, so also great. This is what happens with made up data, is it tends to look pretty good, right? Um, so that's homogeneity. What about homoscedasticity? So remember, I want the spread of the dots to be roughly blobby. And so if I draw a little line around the dots, I want to make sure I don't have any missing holes or UFOs or um, snakes that ate things. Um, and so those are just my examples. You just you don't want it to make any particular shape. So it looks pretty square here. <clears throat> Uh, so I don't have any problems with homoscedasticity, so I am good, right? So it's a check. So that's how we check all the assumptions, which probably will take you longer than actually running the analysis. Okay. So let's actually run moderation. So I'm going to go here, analyze, and then under regression. I already have the plugin installed, um, but if you want to get the plugin installed, you can check out uh, Hayes' website. He has a how-to guide. And so I'm going to click process. And to me, this is really great because I feel like it's fairly intuitive, except for one or two little points. So the first thing you want to do is figure out which one's your DV. So we're going to use grade here and as our dependent variable, which is how we checked for our assumptions as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, which one do I want is my, my, um, my X, and which one do I want is my M? Well, remember that in moderation, what's happening is um, it creates an interaction for you. So you can switch X and M. Now there might be a good reason to do one way or the other, but it doesn't, in mediation this matters, in moderation not so much. So I'm going to stick books into X. So how much do, does books predict grade and attendance into M? And so whichever one you stick into the M slot is the one that's going to be um, separated out into different slopes. So I would ask yourself like, 
which one do I want to think about as a low group, an average group, and a high group? And so what I want to know is at low attendance, how much do the books matter? At medium attendance, how much do the books matter? Because if you can answer that question, which one do I want, low, average, and high? That's the one that should go into M. All right, the other parts process here is you get this model number. Now there are 76 different models. What the heck is this thing? In the folder that you get when you download process, you'll get this templates PDF, what, um, Adobe. And it will show you what all the different models are. So you can flip through and look at all the different types of models. And I'm mainly concerned with one and four. Those are the two big ones. And the first one, model one, is moderation. Okay. So this is a picture depicting interactions because it is moderating or changing the relationship between X and Y at the different levels of M. Um, and so I've stuck, um, I think, books into here, attendance into here, and then grades into here. Okay. And when you watch the video for mediation, we'll talk about model four, just to show you the difference here where, see, this is why it matters, because mediation implies a, a indirect path to Y. So the way I think about mediation is I have this relationship between X and Y, but it's diverted when M is around. Whereas moderation is I have this relationship between X and Y, but I have to think about it as X and Y at low levels of M, average levels of M, and high levels of M. So they're just slightly different questions, and they are very easy to confuse. Okay. Um, so we're going to do model one in this example. So I'm going to change this model number here to one. Bootstrapping will um, test the uh, different effects multiple times. So you can change the number of bootstraps. A thousand is pretty normal. You can make it higher. It will take longer to run. And generally you want to leave bias corrected as your bootstrap method. If you're not familiar with bootstrapping, uh, you can think about it as the lottery with replacement. So what happens is you have all of your data, it will pick numbers from your data, but put them back. So if the lottery was, you know, you'll pick the 56 and I put it back so I could draw that 56 again and create a bunch of samples from your data, the same size as your data, and then run those. And then you'll get an average of all of those different samples. It tends to give you better estimates of what the true population average could be should be so bootstrapping is a good thing for you um, and so you'll want to leave that on essentially so don't make it zero okay. confidence level you can change this to 99 or 90 95 is pretty standard okay and then I would leave this bad boy alone for the types of models that we are doing okay. all right what are all the other things here in the middle well, let's say that you wanted to run an interaction term, but also wanted to control for some other variables. That would be what, where you could stick covariates. So covariates are other variables in the model that you don't want interactions for. Okay, so there are other things you want to include, but you don't want interactions. And then you actually can run sep um, a bunch more moderators. But don't stick a variable in this moderator W, Z, uh, V, and Q, unless you have the right model number picked. It will not run if you stick something in W and it wasn't expecting a W. That's why all the different model numbers. All right, under options here, for model one, we're going to pick the first four. So mean center for products. So what that does is that tells it to center your variables, which you definitely want to do. Um, heteroscedasticity consistent standard errors that will correct for heteroscedasticity so uh, um, also something you want to do is pretty great ordinary least squares maximum likelihood confidence intervals is um, a way that it's going to calculate those bootstraps and definitely want to leave that on that's always usually selected so leave it on and then generate data for plotting so that does only models one two and three and those are the most common moderation models and we're going to leave we're going to turn that on too because we're going to use it so the first four for model one. Hit continue. And then under conditioning here, this is where you can change how it does the centering. Um, and I would tell you to leave it at the most standard option, which is mean and plus and minus one, one standard deviation from a mean. Now I said this does mean center. It does not actually create standard deviations. Um, they both work the same way. So we're gonna see that it's adding and subtracting a standard deviation from the uh, the middle 
and in the output and I'll show you how it works but this is the most common way to do this okay. and we're also going to pick the Johnson name in because it is really cool it's a neat analysis that sort of adds an extra layer to moderation that you can be even more specific about what's going on so let's hit continue and then okay Yeah, like, wait a second. Okay, if your model doesn't run and gives you an error about your variable names being too long, it does actually warn you up here. Um, if your variable names are longer than eight characters, sometimes it runs, sometimes it doesn't. It's horribly inconsistent. Um, so I would tell you if that if you get that error message, just go back into variable view here and change them to something shorter and then it should run for you just fine. So what's going on in all this output? So I'm gonna copy this thing. So if you double click on it, it will give you the option to select all of it and copy it. I'm gonna paste it into Word here and look at it one piece at a time. So I love Process, I think it's really great. Um, it's a fantastic plugin that really makes all this stuff much easier and uh, Haze is awesome. But there is no flare in the output here. So we are gonna talk about like, how do I interpret all this? Cause it does look very different because it's handwritten code. Um, so the first thing is it reminds you what you did. So this is just a reminder. Hey, these are the variables that you stuck into X, Y, and M. Cool. And the next thing it does is it gives me, well, let's move this down to different page just so I can see it all at once. It gives me a model summary box. So this is very similar to the coefficients box in the um, model summary box from a regular multiple linear regression. And it is just the important parts essentially. So if I wanted to talk about is the overall model significant? So with these three predictors, attendance, books, and their interaction, Am I predicting people's scores on grade better than chance? So it's going to be F. Uh, oops, no caps lock. Italics here. So here's my DF1 and my DF2. I need those two. Let's get my highlighter option here. So it's going to be 3 and 36 is equal to, here's F itself, so 11.53. My p-value is the last number out here. It's less than 0.001. We're going to use r squared as our effect size. Okay. And that's this one here under r squared. So 40% of the variance is due to these three predictors. Remember, there's three, attendance, books, and their interaction. The stuff that's going on down here, where it says model, this coefficient thing here, God bless it, should be labeled as B. Okay. This is B. It's the slope. When we think about this, is Y equals A plus BX. Okay, so this first constant one is the intercept, the Y intercept, so it's A. And then this is B here. <clears throat> Alright, so we don't get beta. We do get B, but no beta. So let's talk about does attendance predict grades? So the way I think about this is it's almost a post hoc test, not quite, but kind of that idea. Let me talk about the predictors. So if my model is significant, what's happening with the predictors? Okay. So attendance, here's B. So I would list B as 1.33. And I'm going to use my T value. Remember, degrees of freedom is the second one from uh, my F statistics, so it's 36 equals, okay, this is standard error, so it's this one over, okay, so 2.56. My p-value is the next one, so it's 0.01 here. So that is significant. It's a significant predictor of grades. What the heck does that mean, though? So for every 1.33, I'm sorry, for every one unit increase in attendance, which means one class in this example, we get a 1.33 units increase in grades, okay, which is points. Um, so for every class you go to, 
you get one point, one point on your final grade, which is a lot. That means you should be going to class, right? <clears throat> so let's now do books. Okay, well, what about books? So we know attendance is important. What about books? So here's book. Remember, these are biased by the scale they're in. So it's going to look like this is a much better predictor, right? Because books has a higher number. But remember, books scale is a lot smaller. So um, you can't directly compare Bs. This is why beta is so useful, uh, which we don't quite get in the output. Um, <clears throat> but So I would tell you to just interpret them as they are and not compare them unless you want to compare B values. And then uh, there are a lot of cool online calculators that will do that for you. 36, right. so it's 2.56, it's almost approximately the same, and p is equal to 0.02. Okay. So what does this one mean? It's also significant. So for every one unit increase in books, you'll notice it's the same, so one book in this class, so it's still one unit increase, but for this particular predictor, that means books and not classes we get a 4.5 unit increase in grades. So for every book you read, you get four points on your final grade, okay, on average. Okay, so what about the interaction? Is the interaction significant? So do I need to know about both books and attendance at the same time? Okay, so the B value for that is 0.73. So 36 degrees of freedom. And then here's T and P. And of course it's significant. This is an example. So 2.42. P is 0.02. Okay. Now there's no real direct interpretation of B for the interaction. We've got to do something. Remember anytime you have interactions, you have to do something else to figure out what the heck they mean. Okay. So I can't just say for every one unit increase in interaction. But what does that mean? That's attendance times books. I don't know. So... The next piece of output right here, where it says conditional effect of x on y, is where I interpret my interaction. I would tell you to think about this thing in a different way. So I wouldn't say conditional effect. I mean, that's what it is mathematically. It's a conditional effect. But I always think about this as slopes for what's x. So we got slopes for x is books predicting grades at um, each level of the moderator, which is attendance. Well, I would say the attendance, attendance. Okay. So if you fill in what all of your variables are, this will make a lot more sense. So it's the slope for books, okay, and that's where this is, where it says effect, this is slope for books. So that makes it B, predicting grades, because we're always predicting Y, at each level of attendance here. Now, I don't want to confuse you and have you think that this actually has broken things into levels. Like, it did not go into the data and say, okay, all of you people are low attenders, and all of you people are medium attenders, and all of you people are high attenders. That's not the way this works. So what happens is... Uh, mathematically, since we've made these zeros, here, let's move this down so I have more room here to work, is that we sort of have, have worked out what is the slope for books given that attendance, like if everyone was scoring one standard deviation below the mean. Okay. So let me back up a second. What are these numbers here under attendance? Like why are they what they are? So remember at first, that the data is centered, okay, which means we've taken attendance as mean and subtracted it from everybody um, for attendance only. And so this is the average. Okay. So an aver at an average level of attendance, here's what happens for books. So what does that mean? Well, if you want to get really like, okay, I want to understand what this um, says to me. Let's go back, descriptives, frequencies here and calculate the mean for attendance. I'm gonna make sure I have mean selected, great. Hit okay. You actually have this number already, but I'm gonna show you. So the mean for attendance is 14 points. So this slope here is for when people are going to 14 classes. And so it's the average level of attendance. 
And that's why I said centering is so useful because basically it makes the average zero. And so um, it makes it really easy to calculate these numbers because when the number is zero and you're filling it in the equation, right? So we've said that the effects are, well, we have some sort of constant, which we aren't going to use here. Okay. Um, plus, let's go back up here and look at these. We've got 1.33, 4.15, And so we've got 1.33 times books. Oops, no, attendance, sorry. Plus 4.15 times books. Plus 0.73 times the interaction. So I got books times attendance. Okay. What happens when we fill in the mean, which is now zero? We've got 1.33 times zero, which is zero, plus 4.15 times books, because we're trying to figure out what the slope is for books, not the actual score, like two for books, times 0.73 times books times zero. So it's still zero. So essentially, for books, the equation becomes the constant plus 4.15. And look here, at the average, the effect, so the second one over, I know I've moved them around, but it's the second one over, is 4.15. Because when you fill in the zero that we've made, everybody, everything else drops out. So it makes books 4.15 as their slope. Now that same sort of thing happens for what I usually call the low group. Okay, so they're 4.28 points below the mean. So it's basically taking 14, the average, and subtracting 4 points, which is around 10. I'm going to round here to make life easy. So that's people who are going to about 10 classes. And so their slope here, I'm going to make all these line up again, Whoop. is 1. All right, for this last group, I'm going to call high, they're four points above the mean, so they're going to class around 18 times. And then their slope is seven. And so I won't bore you with the details of how exactly this works, because it actually puts everybody in the middle and uses a zero thing to calculate. But um, what we're doing is coming up with the slopes if people were all considered a, a lower than average, and then the slopes where everybody is average, and then the slopes where everybody is high. So it does not actually create you three separate groups in the background in your data set. It uses all the same data, but sort of pretends that people are below average, and at average, and above average, to calculate what would the slope be if everybody was knocked down four points, and then what would the slope be if everybody was knocked up four points. So the way you interpret that is, so remember this is the sort of the post hoc for interactions, it's called simple slopes, is you just talk about each slope separately. Okay, so I would say for low attendance, okay, um, books is, whoops, wrong thing, there we go, oh, I did it again, I don't know what I'm doing, there we go, 1.01. My t value is going to be 36 still, and it's not significant. I got 0.53, and p is 0.60. Okay. So I used these two out here, so t and p. Okay. So for low attendance, low attenders, there is no relationship between books and grades. So if you're not going to class, reading the books ain't going to help. Now let's do the same thing for average attendance. Books, B, not G, phonetically similar, not the same words, 4.15. So T is 36. So it's going to be the same one as above. And we've got these two values. So it is significant. <clears throat> it's the same thing as the main effect for books. So for average attendance, um, every book gives us 4.15 points on our final grade. 
Now, for the last one, for high attendance books, beer is 7.30 if we round up. Thirty-six, right? So I got three, three point two five. So three point two five. My p-value is 0.01. Okay. So for uh, high attendance, so people who are going to class eighteen or more times, um, every book gives us seven point three points on our final grade. And what you tend to see in these moderation effects, or not what you tend to see, what happens is you, you get this fan effect, or, for, um, or they'll switch directions, which is still a fan. When you see this in, the, in a picture, you'll see what I mean. Um, where this effect tends to get much stronger as you go up, or much weaker, or it flips directions, where some people have a positive relationship, some people have a negative relationship. But basically, if you're not going to class, books doesn't matter. The more you go to class, the more the books help. So you're getting this sort of snowball effect. Okay. All right. <clears throat> and so for a lot of people, this is where they'll stop at simple slopes. But I think the johnson Naiman's worth talking about because it's really neat. Um, and it used to just be impossible to do. So uh, thank thankfully, we now have an easy way. And so what happens is, what it will do is it finds the exact point, so this is P out here, it doesn't quite line up, where the relationship between uh, still books and grades is exactly 0.05. So let me do this and put all of it on the screen at once. So it finds the spot at which it's exactly P equals 0.05. If that does not exist, there's no relationship, this will be blank in your output. And so that's where it's getting this number from. It tells you the percent of the data that's below that point and the percent of the data that's above that point. Now, it is bounded by your data, right? So uh, this is still 1.2 points below the mean. So remember, the mean is 14 points. And so that is about 13 points. And the, so the bottom most number and the top most number will be the upper and lower ends of your data. So if, if I add 14 plus 5.9, I'll get 20. Um, and 20 was the top in the min max. So let me go back. For attendance here, I have 6 to 20. And so essentially, this point here is somebody who scored 6. This point here is somebody who scored 20. So it finds that exact 0.05 point, takes the two endpoints, and then breaks it into um, smaller uh, standard deviation units until it has about 20 or 25 of these. Okay. Um, and so that's, it, it will be seemingly random, like how many points it's adding and subtracting, but it's just uh, partitioning your data up into equal segments around this number. Okay. <clears throat> All right, now not equal segments above and below, obviously, since we have 40 and 60, but equal segments um, around the upper and lower end where 4, 0.05 is in there somewhere. And there might be multiple 0.05 points. It might be significant in some areas and not significant in other areas. All right, but for our data, it's significant at all of these spots, so it's called a zone of significance, and it's not significant here. So that gives me even more information. Like, I already told you that at low attendance, books don't matter. But really, the question then becomes, well, how much do I have to attend so books could matter? Right? And so it looks to me like all of this down here, it doesn't matter how many books I'm reading, okay, <clears throat> um, because none of them are significant. So P is this third to last one here. So 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.8. Okay. So at attendance levels of 6 all the way up to 1.8 below the mean, so that's about 12.2, so it's below 14, it doesn't matter if I read any books. So um, <clears throat> attendance and... Uh, our books and grades are unrelated. But at above that point, so once I start going to class at least 13 times and up, books do matter. And look, the effect slowly gets bigger and bigger. So remember this column is the, um, the slope. So if I'm going to class 20 times, I'm getting 8.5 points out of every single book. And so you can look and like get a better feel for where does the moderation really happen? And so the way to report this isn't totally standardized. Most people talk about that cut point. 
So at, um, at you can either say one standard deviation point below attendance or one point below attendance, or I would say at around 13 attendance units. Uh, let's do this less awkwardly. So at around, at, let's say, when attending at least 13 times, I made it very concrete, books and grades are significantly related. Whoops. Okay. And you can actually plug in the T values for those. So the T value is here, 2.03. Whoopies. Let's type here, 2.03. And this is where P is 0.05. And you can say what the B value is, so it's 3.26 for books. Okay. <clears throat> All right, and then um, you could sort of summarize what happens to the rest. As attendance increases, the relationship between books and grades becomes more positive with the highest attendance, um, so that's 20 times, right? This is particular to this data set. Um, B value, sorry, 8.5 or 8.49. So I'm kind of giving you an idea of how much it's increased. So T here is 3.25. P is less than 0.01. Right, so as attendance increases, the relationship between books and grades becomes more and more positive with the highest attendance having a book relationship of 8.49 points, where the, the point in which it becomes significant, it's only three points. So that kind of gives people an idea of what's happening, where the direction is going. Um, but I wouldn't talk about each point separately. I guess you could put it in a table, um, but at least give people where the zones of significance are and um, an idea of what's happening. So is it getting more negative, more positive? Is it flipping back and forth? That sort of thing. All right, we're almost there. So the last thing you wanna do is take this um, uh, conditional effect data, so data for visualizing conditional effect, and plug that into SPSS to create a chart. Now, the newer version of process that I have on my computer actually gives you um, some um, syntax that you can run, but it creates you a scatter plot. So that's a perfectly viable option, but you tend to see these as just line graphs. So I would probably tell you to actually do it as a line graph, and that's how I'm gonna do it now. Okay. All right. So what I'm gonna do is create myself a new SPSS data set. Okay, not a new output though, new. Ta-da, all right. <clears throat> and so I'm gonna, I'm in variable view, I'm gonna call this books, not box, silly me. Uh, books, attendance, and what's my Y? Grades. So Y hat out here really should be listed as Y. It's predicted Y values at each of these levels. Then I'm gonna be super awesome. I'm gonna give it labels so I don't have to do this later. Um, so this is going to be number of books read, and for attendance, it's going to be number of classes attended, final course grade, okay. just so I don't have to change X and Y labels in a minute. And then here under values, we're going to cheat. Now you could type in the standard deviation units uh, and let it give the scores, or you could make those actually what that is in your data. But I like to just call them low. So negative one is low, zero is average, and one, because they're one standard deviation above and below the mean. So I'm just gonna kind of cheat here, kind of high. Right. Um, you could actually label these as 1.43 points, or uh, for attendance, you could say 10 attendance times. So some people like to see the scale. So I hit okay. And then you can copy that and stick it also in attendance. Um, if you are selective where you get the, th you see the three dots, you can cut and paste it. Otherwise, you can just type in the same thing. Okay, so hit okay. 
here under data view, what I'm going to do is for every time it's negative here, I'm going to type it in as negative 1. Zero. Okay, so that's going to give me low. And every time it's 0 over here, I'm going to actually list it as 0, so I get average. Every time it's positive over here, I'm going to do it as positive 1. And so the same pattern is going to appear any time you do um, this sort of graph with this plugin, okay, or in general. So we've got low average high, low average high. Now for attendance, we look at the column, it goes low, 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 average, 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 high, high, high. So don't do this column twice because you will not get a picture otherwise. So negative one, negative one, negative one, zero, 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 one, one, one. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So make sure that books column and attendance column are not the same or it won't run. Now, I can't be lazy for this column. You're going to take y hat and type it here in the grades. So 54, 45, 55, 90, 57, 35, 55, 65, 61, 60, 67, 55, 56, 85, 67, 30, and 77, 76. So I do need to predict it values. Right. <clears throat> now we're going to use Chart Builder. So go to Graphs. Oh, I lied to you. Under Variable View, make sure the measure here is listed as nominal, nominal, and scale. Okay. Now one of the nominal ones here could be listed as scale, but we have categorized them into low, medium, and high to make this graph happen. So um, and we're going to use a, a uh, clustered line graph, and one of them has to be scale or it won't work. So let's go. Anal uh, graphs, sorry. Chart builder. A. Okay. So click here on line. Click clustered here, or multiple lines. Sorry, it's clustered bar graph, multiple lines. So drag and drop or double click. And the one over here has to be uh, nominal, I'm pretty sure, to make set color happen. I'm pretty sure it won't let you put a continuous variable in a set color, yeah. So that's why I listed them as nominal. Remember that you can also right click on them and change it here in the actual chart builder window. All right, so I'm gonna take um, books here and put it on X. And so I'm gonna put my X variable in X and my M variable in the set color because then your simple slopes will match the picture. Okay, so I tend to stick M up here, X down here, and of course Y needs to always go into Y. If you've watched a bunch of my other videos, you'll know that I'm like super crazy about doing error bars, like always, always have error bars. But in this example, you won't have error bars because we don't have the whole data. We have summarized the data to make a chart, so I won't have error bars. Um, and you could do this with uh, Excel and add your own error bars. That would probably be even better. Uh, but to show you like kind of the best, the simplest way to make these charts is to, um, to leave error bars off. So if you click that button, it will give you an error, it won't run. So let's hit OK. Let's look at what we got here. <clears throat> so first things first, when you're looking at this chart, first of all, let's get rid of this awful background. There we go. Go away, make it white. Um, you want to make sure that your lines, oop, there it goes, aren't bent. Okay. So my lines should be straight. Now they might be just a little, because if your decimals are off a little bit, they might look like they have a little kink in them, but they should be straight. So you don't want a line that's like la 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 la, boop. Okay. So um, they should be straight if you type them in right. Okay. Because I went through all the trouble to label everything beforehand, it does give me everything nice and pretty and journal style. So mean final course grade. I could change that off and make that average. Um, <clears throat> low average and high, low average and high. And so it tells me what is going on. Now remember, our slopes were for low attendance. Here's what happened. Books don't matter. Check it out. It's flat. For average attendance, books matter more. And for high attendance, they matter the most. And so that's why I stuck attendance <clears throat> into my set color one was so that I got slopes for each one so it would match my output. Okay. All right, now what about the y-axis? Well, there's two, sort of two trains of thought on this one when you're looking at the y-axis. 
you could make it the entire range of the data. So this data actually could run from 0 to 100. Okay. <clears throat> and um, ooh, why did it go 50? Don't do that. There we go. <clears throat> right. So I could make it 0 to 100 because that's how that's what final course grade could be. However, I don't know that I want to extrapolate to people who are scoring a zero, because it looks kind of like in the moment like you couldn't actually score a zero in this class, right? And so I might change it to around the actual data that I have. Oops, let's do 80 here. Now remember out here it tells you the data that you have. So uh, I tend to tell people when you're making bar graphs, make it the entire range of the data. So like on a Likert scale, if it's one to seven, make that bar graph one to seven, because that is the possible score that people could get. So you don't exaggerate the difference between bars um, by shortening the axis. And then on this type of data, there's sort of two ways. You can think about it as the entire possible range of the data, but then that implies uh, sort of this extrapolation to scores that you didn't actually test. So you could make it just the range of the data that you've got. So from 50 to 80, these are the uh, simple slopes I would expect because I've tested data from 50 to 80. All right, <clears throat> uh, let me close that. So this is a, a more zoomed in picture of the interaction and that seems to match our slopes a little more like that, like low, okay, that's one point, three points, um, or I think it was four points and nearly eight points. So that matches my image of what these slopes should look like a little better. Um, but either way, it's sort of appropriate. So that is the graph that you would make um, for this type of analysis. So people could see the fan effect. If you make this graph and there are three perfectly parallel lines, you have no interaction. Um, and that concludes how do you do moderation and SPSS with the process plugin starting from power all the way through to graphs.